So we are Slipop Technologies, and I have the pleasure of entertaining you all for the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Um, our motto is simple, uh, rethinking nuclear. Um, I'll just start by saying, with the current status of the planet and the issues that we are facing as a humanity here, nuclear is absolutely needed. I don't, don't think there's any doubt about uh, something needs to be done. But I've also grown up in a world where everybody has been talking about it for all of my life, and still nothing has happened. Um, so that that, um, that leads me to my first slide, <coughs> which is our fundamental hypothesis here in CBOC, that uh, if we are to decarbonize, it has to happen on market terms. Um, I, we are too a mature company that I can say it, but uh, when we were a smaller company, I always said the killing code with capitalism. If we are to decarbonize, we need alternatives that are cheap enough and scales fast, where fast is ridiculous speed and cheap enough just means that it's the most attractive solution for the owners of the power plants. Because then uh, if we pick nuclear over coal, yeah, then we get greener. So first, who are we in Seabog? Uh, we were founded in uh, 2040, so uh, we're getting older. Um, we got our first funding in 18, so we haven't had funding for very long. Um, we're privately held and privately funded. So uh, we're in Europe, so uh, there's not a lot of grants in this area. And it's actually a really big upside to be privately funded because that means we are very agile with our pathways and we can think outside the box where we, if you get too much uh, funding, you have to do it as it's usually done. And uh, what we know in nuclear is we cannot do it as it's usually done. We are now we are, we have passed 130 people recently. Um, we have people from 26 countries, so we are we are a very diverse team from all over the world. Um, and we have our headquarters here in Denmark, and then we also have a business office in both South Korea and one in Singapore. And we are not just uh, a small startup, or we are just a small startup, but uh, but we are partnering up with some heavy guys. Um, the most heavy of them is actually Samsung. Samsung is not a small organization, and um, they allocated a very, very tiny bit of manpower to us down in the corner. And it turned out that that was 300 engineers showing up at the kickoff meeting. So it's, uh, it's a different level. It's hard to manage 300 engineers uh, in another company when you're only uh, 130 people. But we also have uh, other really big players, both in Europe uh, and a, a lot in South Korea, because that's where they could have manufactured. On top of being um, a small startup, we actually now a group structure, because uh, our central IP is around uh, sodium hydroxide, which most of you probably know as drain cleaner. It's You probably have some at home under your kitchen sink. Um, it's an old chemical that the Egyptians used, to uh, to make soap so it's it's a really ancient chemical uh, but since the egyptians we have figured out that we can also use it for drain cleaner uh, because no chemist in their right mind would look at the sodium hydroxide we weren't chemists so we did it anyway and when we found some chemists they were out of their mind and uh, we started looking into sodium hydroxide and i'm not going to talk more about too much about it i'm just saying on our path to getting a nuclear reactor we need some prototyping done which actually with small modifications uh, could be used as an energy storage. So we started looking into that pathway. Turns out sodium hydroxide is so much cheaper than the alternatives out there that it's actually a very compatible energy storage solution for thermal energy storage. So, uh, so we have patented that uh, very thoroughly and have a spin out uh, there. They are, they are around 30 people just for scale. And are actually in construction of the first prototype or well, starting construction these days. So in CBOC on the nuclear side, we are, we're not looking at Europe, we're looking at Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia is a really interesting market because uh, firstly, they actually do want nuclear. Uh, secondly, they have a problem that there's not a lot of wind around the equator. And uh, there's, um, there's also, it's very hard to do solar around the equator because you're either in a jungle region where there's cloudy days and monsoon seasons or you're in a, in a desert region where there's sandstorms. In both cases, you can't use solar. So they cannot use renewables as we can in Europe. That makes their choice between coal, gas, and nuclear. And today, they're not allowed to use nuclear with the, with the present uh, way the regulatory system functions. So that's, that's one of our innovations. 
Uh, and I think this will talk all of the different speakers up today uh, a little bit on the fluoride salts. Um, fluoride salts are, um, for a chemist, it's a salt. Um, but for a regular person, it's like a crystal rock. So it's a rock. Behaves like a rock. It doesn't dissolve into water. It doesn't. Uh, it it behaves just as you would imagine a rock behaves. And we we actually have uh, a lot of sodium hydroxide, like you know, uh, fluoride salt dying around here, which is just bought in the healer shop down the corner. Uh, so it has healing powers and all that. But uh, it also it, it has really nice, excellent properties for nuclear power because you can dissolve your uranium into the salt. Uh, also on a fluoride form and melt it, pump it into a nuclear reactor and get a lot of energy out. Uh, the magic is not in the operations or all of this. Um, the magic is that if it gets out in some way, the dangerous radioactive elements, the fission products, they have reacted with the fluoride and have formed fluoride salts on its own. So all the volatile, uh, dangerous fission products are actually salts that behave like rock. So instead of in, a, in the worst case accident and for a nuclear station, it's unimaginable. But if somebody were to bomb the nuclear plant and explode this everywhere, then it solidifies and stays instead of releasing a gas. And that's a very, very different um, property for nuclear. And it means that instead of reducing the likelihood of an accident, you can focus at reducing the consequences of the accident, which is actually much smarter. And that's the magic behind both salt and I. I believe this to be true for, for all of the different actors. So uh, this is, uh, then they can save two minutes in their pitch. But that's a very, very important uh, pretension um, element. So what we are doing is, since we're using sodium hydroxide, we can get a much, much more compact nuclear reactor than you can with, uh, with, um, with heavy water or graphite or what else you could use. Um, meaning that we have a very small reactor. That means that we can actually fit it onto a barge. So that's what we're doing. And hence we have Samsung in it. They're designing the barge part. Um, so the barge, as you see here, has two reactors per white box on top. In the white box on top, there's a turbine from, from Siemens, actually, an off-the-shelf coal turbine, which is a little bit disruptive in itself because in the nuclear industry, you have to custom build turbines. We don't. We can use the turbines that today is manufactured for coal power stations because we are at high temperature. So that's really important. And so by taking these off-shelf components and putting them together, together with, uh, of course, not off-shelf reactor, which we have to develop and, and, and has some new technology elements to it, then we believe we can put these on batches, mass produce them in a high-ranked shipyard and ship them to where it's needed in Southeast Asia. And that's what we're working with Korea. Uh, an upside in being on batches is that you get these chunks uh, that you can put together. So here you see 200 megawatt in the, in the smallest version and 800 in the biggest, which is just four copies of the same 200 module. So, so um, it's very much. One thing we get when we do our analysis um, is that because of this retention property, instead of the normal emergency planning zone of a nuclear power station, which today is typically 250 kilometers or similar, we get 750 meters. So if you live outside 750 meters, you're not affected by the worst case scenario, even, even the plant being bombed or terrorism or something. So that's really an upside, meaning you can put these close to cities. You can put it in any industrial harbor. Um, we are probably not going to put them in industrial harbors because industrial harbor space is more expensive than, uh, than just 10 kilometers outside the city. Uh, but it, it's a very different dynamics with these uh, batches. So I'm out there selling it. Um, we say we have a reactor that cannot build down or explode. It's, there's a long, long list of reasons for that. I'm sure some of the other speakers will, uh, will talk about that. Cannot release uh, radioactive gases to air water, which is actually the most important point. And it's, of course, a truth with modifications, but all the dangerous elements are contained. Um, and then it cannot be used for, for nuclear weapons, which is quite important if you want to get to developing countries. Then we operate for 12 years without refueling. That was not very important half a year ago, but uh, today I think everybody would like to have a stable pricing of the energy for the next 12 years. Um, so we will come with it. 
we have been designing this very bottom up. So we started in the lab with the fluoride salts and now the hydroxides. And we're actually building our fifth lab right now, um, just uh, one floor down from where I'm sitting now. We're building a 1,200 square meter lab. So that's a really big lab. We currently have four other labs in operation. Um, one of them I consider probably the state of the art lab when it comes to fluoride salts. At least none of our chemists have seen a lab which was more state of the art in the area. We have a lot of really expensive equipment in there and we actually have a lot of space for it to be used so people are not queuing for it, which is really important for research fast. And then we have um, a hydroxide salt lab, which is to my knowledge, the only one in the world because no chemist in the right mind uh, works with hydroxides. Since we did that anyway, we actually managed to get it to work in the lab, and um, and uh, now we can actually operate in prototype conditions for, uh, we don't know for how long, but uh, we haven't run anything for more than 1,100 hours or so, then we uh, stop the test and chop it up uh, to see what is inside. Uh, but we, we can assumingly run it for years by now. So um, just a little bit of technical here. Uh, the batch itself has two reactor modules in front of the turbine. It has a control unit with maintenance uh, quarters too, so it can be operated as you would operate an oil rig and fly in qualified personnel from wherever you want. Then it has trans a transformer station in front. After 12 years, we install two new reactors and they operate for an additional 12 years. So the product life cycle is 24 years, which I will just say is actually also a really short time horizon in the energy market or in the nuclear industry where we are typically talking 60 or 80 years. That means in this case that uh, according to our models, the break-even point for the investor is after seven years. And uh, there's no energy projects in the world uh, today that has such a short time horizon. So we plan to use the European supply chain to, uh, to deliver subcomponents like pumps and valves and stuff. We have a lot of partners there already. And, and actually we have a, on top of our labs, we have a hall where we are testing pumps right now. Uh, and, and these things. Um, we plan to assemble them somewhere locally here and then ship the reactor, which can fit in a 20 foot container. We ship it to South Korea, where Samsung and uh, others take over and assemble a barge. Um, that one shipyard that Samsung ha have could actually build 150 to 200 of these barges every year. Turns out that the uh, uh, Siemens has uh, has the same cap capability to produce turbines for coal power stations, and they would like to shift to something green with those uh, production lines. So that fits well together. And then we'll ship it to wherever they are needed and do Power Plus X. Just to put an extra comment on Power Plus X, I think it's mainly relevant here in North Europe. Um, Intermittent, we, emit, we imagine that we'll produce hydrogen and ammonia from intermittent sources. But in effect, intermittent sources give you cheap electricity sometimes. Then we need batteries or nuclear or whatever to fill in the holes. And then sometimes renewables give you too much electricity and then you need the hydrogen or ammonia. But with that business model, there's no realistic way to get to scale. When you take nuclear power, you can actually deliver constant electricity to the city, which is higher value than the variable electricity. And then you can have a constant production of ammonia. And then if the grid gets into special needs, which happens a few hours per year or something, then um, you can switch some electricity off the hydrogen or ammonia facility to save the grid. And that's a, that's a really important dynamic. And when we look at the economy of that, that just makes the electricity worth orders of magnitude more than what it is worth from, from renewables. So it's not just about what it costs, it's also what it's worth. Anyway, we, we have been uh, doing a big study with uh, Vietnam to deploy 5.2 gigawatt. Trust, and, just one um, comment, we just have for you, uh, uh, you know, one or two minutes left, Max. Yeah, yeah Sorry but I'm that. also done in one or two minutes, so it's perfect. Um, so we are we are looking with Vietnam at uh, at a project where we should deploy 5.2 gigawatts. I said earlier that it's impossible to deploy nuclear in developing countries. Yes, it is under the current regulatory framework, but we can actually apply a maritime framework where we get an international uh, 
highly standing country to put a flag on the barge and saying we have the inspection rights so you live up to the right standards on the nuclear power station and that enables vietnam to get um, nuclear power much sooner than than they otherwise could so now i'm rounding off develop in denmark built in south korea and power the world that's the motto with the supply chains that already exist we could some year reach 200 power batches actually that is with our partner supply chain alone and uh, funnily enough, 200 power batches per year that corresponds to roughly five times the global offshore wind production manufactured uh, to date. So, uh, so that that it's a lot of power, and we really need nuclear because it's a it's one of those big handles that we need to take and use to uh, fight uh, okay. global warming. Th thanks. thanks. Can, we, can we maybe open it up to some questions now? Yeah. So, uh, remind people, uh, je rappelle aux gens que si vous voulez poser une question, vous pouvez utiliser la fonction lever la main au milieu de la barre en bas de votre écran. If you'd like to ask a question to Charles, uh, please use the raise hand feature. So, we have a first question. I cannot uh, read the name in Hebrew, but uh, when you expect your first barge basically to work? Um, I mean, a lot of things has to work out, right? But uh, we are aiming for 28. Um, there are, of course, some bottlenecks there. Um, the regulatory system has to accept this in a very fast manner. The maritime regulatory system can do that. The question is if we can get the nuclear regulatory along. Uh, the same, another issue is the fuel. Getting fuel in that time frame is actually very hard. So there's a couple of issues, but I also think with the need for this, I think the world will get behind it, and then I think things will move much faster. So I, I don't think it's completely unrealistic. So we're aiming for 28 for the first power batch. Okay, uh, there's Jacques. a question from Jacques Leger. Okay, you have to, uh, to do it. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, first question about. Uh, safety uh, you said uh, it cannot explode it cannot uh, send gas in the atmosphere because in case of uh, uh, temperature going down the salt are becoming solid is that what you said yes yeah uh, you said you talk about the 12 plus 12 years already equipped in the barge in in two modules is that right uh, close enough <laughs> and you said the third point that i did not pick up concerning safety in one of your slides uh, the third point was that it cannot be used for nuclear weapons that's, ah, yeah. uh, that's a longer discussion on proliferation and how you handle both your chemistry and so we do no online refueling we don't use nuclear waste we don't recycle. We could recycle spent fuel, but we are not doing it. Uh, we will get there when the rules are, are ready for it. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So we have a question, I think, on the chat, which is, uh, Charles, why do you do it on the sea barge and not on land? There are two reasons. Firstly, uh, let me do a metaphor here. Uh, and if, you and car, if it sinks <laughs> okay, okay that's a, that's another that's a whole other beast okay so firstly if you buy a car uh, and uh, the car manufacturer sends 20 engineers to your garage to build the car it would be really really expensive and that's what we generally do in the energy sector if you want to build nuclear somewhere you start by educating 6,000 engineers then waiting for them to build experience and then you can build the nuclear plant or you can ship thousand engineers abroad from somewhere else um, when you build a shipyard you have the same workforce repeatedly doing this um, so there's a big upside there steel is more expensive than concrete but what you pay for in projects like this are is work workforce anyway so so there's a good good reason to build on shipyards then where you want to deploy it is for a lot of the new build projects it's actually in smaller communities which are isolated that makes new building there even harder. So that's the first incentive. The second one is that by using the maritime pathway, in the maritime they're used to taking onshore, new, uh, onshore regulatory requirements, 
and, and adopting them into maritime. And they're really, really good at that because oil industry, they don't want to wait 20 years for regulators. They want it now. So they ha have a really, really lean process for doing that, where it's like in the nuclear industry, you're in the passenger seat waiting for the regulatory, uh, regulatory authority to drive the car. But here you are in the driver's seat and the regulatory authority is the driver teacher. And you have to drive well enough that they don't push the brake. So we will live up to all the okay. same requirements, but but it will be um, uh, it'll be a different process, and that actually makes it much faster. So that's awesome. And okay. then if it falls, I think we need to <laughs> we need to go to the to the next. Yeah, Charles, uh, there, are, there are a few more questions on the chat. Maybe you can answer them while we go to the next uh, presentation. Yeah, um, great. thank I'll you. Try. 